Now that you're convinced that the chain rule is actually worthwhile, because the algebra can get tedious otherwise, we're going to look at another example for y equals x squared plus 1 to the 50th power. Now, no one on the right, in the right mind is going to want to foil this 50 times, so we're definitely going to use the chain rule here. We're going to start by decomposing the function, and we're going to let y equal u to the 50th, and we're going to let u, the specific inner function, be x squared plus 1. So the derivative of this will be 50u to the 49th, and u prime is going to equal 2x. And the formula says that I need to multiply these two outcomes together. So the derivative overall is going to be 50u to the 49th times 2x. And now we have to make a final adjustment in replacing the u with x squared plus 1. So the derivative is equal to 50 blank to the 49th times 2x. The blank was where u had gone, and u is x squared plus 1. And cleaning up the first, or the beginning and the last factors, we get 100x times x squared plus 1 to the 49th power. So once you start getting the hang of it, it's really not so bad. And we're, all, we're leading up to a shortcut here, which you're going to like even more. And this is called the general power rule. Now, written in this way, it doesn't look so great just because the program I'm using doesn't allow me to write exponents. But if you're taking the derivative of some expression u to the power of n, the general power rule allows us to bring the n down in front, maintain the expression, drop the exponent by 1, and then multiply by the derivative of the expression. That probably doesn't make a whole lot of sense, but we're going to look at this specific example and maybe it'll clear it up for you. So we've got an expression to uh, the power of 3, just like the general power rule would suggest. Without doing all the let's define it in u and then do the u prime, we can just go right to it. The derivative here is going to be the exponent moved down in front, a rewrite of the expression, 3x minus 2x squared, drop the exponent by 1, and then multiply by the derivative of the inside, which in this case is 3 minus 4x. That's really, in essence, what we were doing here, but this is just a little bit quicker. This is the general power rule. Cleaning this up now, we have 3 times 3 minus 4x times 3x minus 2x squared, all of that squared. So that was your first uh, use of the general power rule. You're going to be using this all the time. It supersedes doing this process over here. Much quicker, much less work. Not so bad. So this next example has us go beyond just finding a derivative, but it has us ask, answer the question, uh, where is the derivative equal to 0, and where does the derivative not exist? So let's... Let's first find the derivative, and then we'll talk about what these questions actually mean. And they also give you the graph of the function down below, so you can kind of interplay with that and see how the answers um, respond with that. So let's start by finding the derivative. Let's, let's say uh, y is equal to x squared minus 1 to the 2 thirds. going to use fractional exponents. And now I'm ready to use the chain rule to find the derivative. So the derivative is going to be 2 thirds x squared minus 1. Reduce the power by 1 to negative 1 third. And then multiply by the derivative of the inside, which is 2x. We don't want to have a negative exponent in our final answer, so I'm going to rewrite this and say 4x over 3 times x squared minus 1 to the 
positive one-third of power. So we use the chain rule to find the derivative, and now we're going to answer the two questions. The first question asks, when is the derivative equal to zero? So the derivative is the slope. The slope of the tangent line being zero would represent a horizontal tangent line. So if you look at the graph over here, I can see immediately one place where there's going to be a horizontal tangent line, or, or it's likely to have a horizontal tangent line, and that's right here at z zero, one. So let's, let's take that derivative, set it equal to zero, and see if that's in fact the case. So for part one, what I'm going to do is take the derivative, 4x over 3 times x squared minus 1 to the 1 third, set it equal to 0, which I'll make 0 over 1. Cross multiplying, I get 4x is equal to 0, x is equal to 0. If I plug this value into the original function over here, I get negative 1 squared, which is 1, and the cube root of that is 1. So in fact, I get that there's going to be a horizontal tangent line at the point 0, 1. Okay, the second part of the question asks, where is the derivative, uh, does it, where does it not exist? And we know derivatives don't exist at points where there is a vertical tangent line, a cusp, or a discontinuity. So I'm looking at the original graph and I'm thinking there's probably going to be issues at negative 1 and 1 because there are cusps there. So let's take a look at the, the function or the derivative and see where there's going to be issues. Now, when we look at this, the issues are going to be where the denominator equals zero, because we know from pre-calculus that denominators can never equal zero, and when they do equal zero, those are the issues. So I'm going to take the denominator, and I say, well, where does this equal zero? Dividing by three, I get x squared minus one to the one-third is equal to zero. Then I will take, I will raise both sides, I'll cube both sides. I'm going to cube both sides. x squared minus 1 is equal to 0. x squared is equal to 1. And then x equals plus or minus 1. So at x equals plus or minus 1 are going to be the problem areas where the derivative does not exist. And we can kind of confirm that from the graph because there are cusps there. So everything is making sense. So in summary, this was an example of going a little bit beyond using the chain rule and actually answering a couple additional questions using the first derivative. The next two problems require the use of the chain rule as well, and they're, they're a bit more mechanical. They just show you the different ways that the chain rule might be implemented. In number seven, uh, we start off with a rational function, and what I'm going to do is just rewrite it a little bit differently. G of t is equal to negative 7 times 2t minus 3 to the negative 2. Now as a reminder I've written the general power rule right up here in the corner so if you need to refer to it you can. And uh, we're ready to do that step right now. So the derivative of this function is going to be the exponent brought down in front which gives us 14 2t minus 3, reduce the power by 1, and then multiply it by the derivative of the inner function, which would be 2. Now we've got to clean this up. We can't leave an answer with negative exponents. So what we have here is 28 all over 2t minus 3 cubed. So hopefully that wasn't too bad. And now for our second example, again a little bit more mechanical. Um, we're asked to find the derivative. Now 
when I first look at this, I see a product, but I also see within it a chain rule. So this, this is going to get a little bit more complicated. Uh, the first thing I'm going to do is rewrite it with fractional exponents. f of x is equal to x squared, and then we have 1 minus x squared, all to the 1 half power. Okay, so this is the product. Uh, this is my first factor and this is my second factor. So what I'm going to do is I'll set the f, f prime, g, g prime chart up. Now once you get really, really comfortable with this, some people do away with the chart, but for now I guess we'll use it. The first term is x squared, which uh, the derivative would be 2x. The second term would be 1 minus x squared to the one-half. So this derivative would be, it would require the chain rule and would be one-half, one minus x squared to the negative one-half times the derivative of the inside which is negative two x. So that one thing had a lot of, a lot of stuff going on there. Now I'm going to rewrite this derivative because it's a little bit messy. I noticed that the two here and the two there are going to cancel so I'm left with um, negative x on the top and then on the bottom I have 1 minus x squared to the positive one-half. So let's, let's apply the derivative at this point. So we're going to use the product rule. So the derivative is going to be the first which is x squared times the derivative of the second which is what we just found uh, negative x over 1 minus x squared to the 1 half plus the second which is 1 minus x squared to the 1 half times the derivative of the first which is 2x. Pretty, pretty gross, right? Um, well, we can clean this up a little bit more and now we have to start negative x cubed all over 1 minus x squared to the 1 half plus 2x times 1 minus x squared to the 1 half. And I'm going to put this over 1 because what I'm going to do now is find a common denominator and then I'm, then I'm going to be done. So we are approaching the end. It's, maybe not as bad as you thought. Not as bad as this pen, anyway, which stops writing every once in a while. So anyway, the common denominator would be 1 minus x squared to the 1 half. And to get this to look like this, it's not missing anything. But to get this to look like this, I need to multiply it by 1 minus x squared to the 1 half. This is really just the square root of 1 minus x squared. And this is also the square root of 1 minus x squared. And the square root of chunk times the square root of chunk is just chunk. So we're going to have 2x times the chunk, 1 minus x squared. OK, so moving in the right direction, but a little bit more algebra to do. OK, so we have negative x cubed plus 2x minus 2x cubed all over that denominator which this time I just I just feel like writing this I feel like it's just going to be a little quicker for me we're almost done and I have to go over here the derivative is going to equal mm, 2x minus 3x cubed all over the square root of 1 minus x squared my tips for you would be when you're doing problems like this just to go nice and slow you really want to maintain your organization because if you screw up something right in the beginning you're going to be carrying that mistake throughout the entire problem and it, it could get real ugly if you do that so take it nice and slow and then I think it goes without saying that just the more problems that you practice the better and the more efficient you're going to be be at doing them and you're going to spot little tricks and know hey should I do the product rule here or should I do the chain rule so definitely make sure you do your homework and you, and you practice on the, the problem sets.